Hey, bienvenido a nuestro programa. How are you guys? I'm Izzy for Fruta Extraña here at the Theater for the New City on First Avenue and 10th Street in Manhattan. Now, while Giovanna is getting the 411 on gay and lesbian immigration rights, I'm going to take you on a little journey across the world to the tumultuous but beautiful deserts of Palestine as we get to see Desert Sunrise, a play written by Misha Shulman. Now, in between seeing this exciting show, we're also going to talk to the cast and the author, and we're going to break away to see what Giovanna has learned too. All right, so come with me, and let's take a little trip all the way to Palestine.
I'm here with Yoel Ben Shimon, correct? Ben Shimon. Ben Shimon. Ben, okay. And he was he played a very important part of this piece, and I want him to talk a little bit more about that. Can you tell us about your part in the, in the show? Yeah. Um, basically, Misha, the director, came to me and asked me to uh, compose the music for the show. And uh, politically, I'm also very much connected to the theme of the show and to the issue of Palestinian-Israeli conflict and, in general, um, conflicts with uh, minorities. And uh, with my own ensemble, Sultana Ensemble, I also foster and try to create a dialogue between Arabs and Palestinians. As a matter of fact, I have Palestinian musicians in my band, as okay. well as Christians and Muslims. So composing for this show, what were some of the influences that you used to create for this? I used the uh, uh, classical Arabic music forms, elements, for example, uh, Samai. Okay. I, uh, this particular rhythm that has 10 beats to the measure, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1. Um, this kind of rhythm was written back in Turkey and Iran and Iraq, all the way traced back to the 9th, 10th century. Uh, one of the songs that I sang today is uh, from the Andalusian time, mm -hmm. between the 9th and the 14th century when Arabs and Muslim and uh, Christians and Jews lived together and created a beautiful body of art, music, dance, science. And for me personally, I think it's a message that we have to put out there. I believe we can look at the, this time of the Andalusian era, which is called the Golden Age, and learn from it and try to get to that right, I mean, it's interesting if you, whether you're watching this play or if you're composing music for it, if you step out, really art in itself, whether you're creating music, uh, it, it shouldn't matter, you know, it's, it becomes a universal language, so to speak, and mm -hmm. it's, you know, you bring that point, you know, where, it, whether it's Christians, Jews, it, uh, there's, you can communicate without your personal background, you can create art itself, mm -hmm. you know, I think mm -hmm. this is a great example of that. Um, what was it like for you to be a part of this project and bring in different influences uh, together, personally speaking? It was the most natural, perfect environment for me. The most, this is where I feel safe. This is my bread and butter. Um, I was myself a second lieutenant paratrooper officer wow. in the Israeli army. And I was in the occupied territory in the Lebanon war. And this situation that the audience saw today is a very natural, everyday situation that can take place. And uh, the way the soldier was treating the Palestinian without knowing what's his background was very, you can tell, it was very hostile, very cold at, the, at first. But then when they opened up and they created trust, there was a beautiful moment there, a transformation. Right. I mean, how do you feel the music added to the experience for the audience watching the show? Um, first of all, the, the culture of the Palestinian and the Israeli. Israel, it's a very unique place where you can find uh, people from very, very various eclectic cultures. So I brought today um, elements from the Golden Age, elements of music from Moroccan music. My own family, my father and mother are immigrants from Morocco to Israel. So I'm first generation uh, Israeli. With my own work, I also search for identity. And part of, I discover in, in my research that it's not, there is no such a thing, one identity. Right. Just like I am part of Israeli, Moroccan, American, Western world cultures, identity, which is a mixture of many cultures. Also the culture of Palestinian and, and uh, most of Israelis, when you look at the music, it derives from different sources, North African music, um, Greek music, Turkish music, Persian music. So I think by having the most natural music in that play gave it a very realistic uh, pan, a very realistic um, uh, atmosphere and ambience. No, yeah, you're correct. Um, so what about you personally? What do you have going on besides the show? Do you have any shows coming up, more work that you're creating that we can Check out? Yeah. Um, if you're interested, you can log on sultanamusic.com. Okay. Sultana was my grandmother from Morocco, and she is 
the person that really embedded in me the, the love to this heritage. So you can check the schedule. We just had a great performance in Lincoln Center. Wow. And we are heading to Italy on December 4. Great. So if you happen to be in Milan, come over. I'll try. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Ask them to send you. You want to send us to Milan to watch him? I'd be more than happy to go. <laughs> thank you very much. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Bueno, la verdad que es, por un lado es lamentable y por otro lado pues es, eh, es aceptable, ¿no? Porque a estas alturas de nuestra vida o de, de estos tiempos que estamos, pues hay mayor facilidad y acceso a todo, ¿no? Uh -huh. este, ¿Qué opinión te merece ahora mismo, el, eh, ya enfocándonos ya en el aspecto laboral, eh, las personas de esta comunidad eh, lesbiana, gay eh, y, y transgénero eh, en cuanto a cuando van a solicitar trabajo eh, se supone que la ley estipula de que no debe haber ningún tipo de discriminación por razones de orientación sexual eh, raza, color, lo que sea um, bueno well, hay, creo que hay dos preguntas allá una, una pregunta um, es uh, tenemos muchos sitios con personas quienes quieren tener estatus uh, legal aquí basado en una aplicación de un empleador. Uh -huh. Pero una cosa que es importante entender es que bajo de la ley en este momento, um, si una persona está en los Estados Unidos sin estatus legal, si no importa si entró legalmente y, y se quedó más tiempo que fue autorizado o si entró cruzando la frontera, uh, cuando una persona está aquí ilegalmente, Normalmente no es posible para esta persona cambiar su estatus de estar aquí ilegalmente, de estar aquí legalmente. Uh -huh. so, para una persona así, aun si uh, en, encontró a un empleador quien está, um, you know, quiere hacer la, la aplicación para uh, una visa sabiendo. de trabajar, eh, no es una posibilidad. Um, con, con, y con la otra pregunta... Um, sobre protecciones en, en lugares de, de trabajar, you know, estamos muy fortunados de vivir en, en la ciudad de, de Nueva York porque es, um, you know, tenemos protecciones como personas you know, lesbianas, gay, transgénero, que un empleador no es, está, um, es ilegal para you know, um, terminar a una persona basada en su orientación sexual o su um, identidad de, de género. Um, pero en otras partes del país la situación es, es muy diferente, diferente. y uh, you know, frecuentemente cuando es, estoy hablando con personas buscando asilo, you know, cuando yo pregunto a, a la persona qué pasó a, a, a usted en su país, cuál, cuáles problemas tenía, Tú, uh -huh. um, la persona contesta, bueno, you know, perdí tres trabajos porque mi empleador me, me terminó cuando sabía mi orientación sexual me pero Ajá. sí pero realmente para casos del asilo eso no normalmente cuenta. no sirve y yo you know, siempre tiene, tiene, tengo que uh, decir a una persona así que bueno si usted vivía en Alabama o otras partes de los Estados Unidos no es no es ilegal a terminar una persona basado solo en, en su orientación sexual o, o su identidad de, de género. So, las cosas en los Estados Unidos you know, no no tenemos derechos enteros en los Estados Unidos tampoco.
They needed to explain something to me. The shortest one of them, I am dying. With a horse voice. Push me on my knees. And said, you're my donkey. You always were and always will be. For 35 years now we've known that Jews are going to ride the Palestinians like donkeys into the 21st century. They think to the public right now. Now here I'm talking to the actor who plays Ismail. Could you introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Noor. And tell us a bit more of what uh, inspired you to take this role on. Okay, uh, a friend, a dear friend of mine, actually referred me to Misha. Uh, told me just to go say hi to Misha. And uh, there's a play, there's a part that I might be able to book it. Uh, I had a very busy schedule. However, I went to say hi to Misha. And what attracted me more about the subject was uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict. And I always really pay attention to this uh, subject because it sounds like it's uh, the source of any other struggle in the Middle East. Therefore, we sat down, we chit chat for a nice 15 minutes. We did not discuss any script, no character. The first question he asked me was, what do you think of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? And in processing of time, uh, within the next 10, 15 minutes, uh, I found that he's such a wonderful guy. Uh, very, very liberal in his thoughts, and uh, I just, you know, I whispered to, to myself, I said I would love to work with this guy, he sounds like, uh, he's a big deal, I would love to. Uh, as we discussed the character of Ismail, uh, it was a bit difficult for me, I mean, I thank him very much for breaking it down to me and let me know who Ismail is, because basically, I'm Egyptian, uh, I'm not Palestinian, I did not live in a desert, I really do not know what is it like to live in a cave or any of these things. But he was giving me all these ideas and all these tools about a caveman, you should act accordingly to this. Oh, he insulted your woman, no, you should go do this. Uh, yes, it did have to do something with Arabism, however, uh, cavemen have a different style, obviously. They're not very civilized, however, they're very simple people, uh, just uh, living uh, by looking after their sheep and just eating, drinking, eating simple things. They don't have that many... Uh, of uh, desires and requests except peace uh, as the play uh, showed us uh, yeah based on that I, I truly loved it but I had no idea that I was the chosen one until uh, he told me <laughs> <later> on. <laughs> <laughs> so, well considering your personal views what was it like jumping into Ismail's shoes well Ismail is such a wonderful guy I mean he's very peaceful uh, as you may see I mean even, even I'm, I've been told by Misha, I'm on stage before anybody else comes in or as they are coming in because this is basically my home, this is my house. So also, you know, I'm, I'm being adopted to my land. I mean, uh, I have no other requests except just fix nice cup of tea for my lady who's coming to propose to her. That is it. I got nothing basically except some tea. <laughs> and that, that, that's me. So Ismail is just very simple. He's so down to earth because there's no other alternative. He doesn't know any other way. <laughs> and just cannot wait for Lila to appear so he could just have a wonderful talk with her and propose. So uh, what does he end up with at the end? Ismail ends up, oh my God. Ismail suffered throughout the play, apparently. I mean, like, Ismail, apparently, I mean, uh, correct me if I'm mistaken, Misha. I mean, I, I don't think Ismail has gone to any schools or learned anything. Maybe just uh, sixth grade at the most. That's all it is. He's so proud of Lila because uh, she's uh, very experienced in life. Uh, she lives in a city. Uh, she speaks languages. Uh, she's well educated, basically. So he looks up to her, and that's that's the that's the young lady who has been uh, in love with for a long time. Uh, he's not very aware of American literatures or what's going on in the world, but he knows that there is an Israeli forces occupying Palestine. That's all he knows. Uh, therefore, as long as he has an access to maybe to his uh, sheep and his water wells, I, don't, I think he'll be very happy. Uh, now with the confrontation between Tzachi, my best buddy, and Laila comes in, 
I'm trying to calm them both down. I mean, this is my love, leave her alone. And this guy, we just had a wonderful time. We just smoked some hashish together and uh, we had a dream. We had a wonderful time. So he's not, he's not a bad guy. He, he's a very nice guy, regardless of the gun that he has. But then uh, Lila kept it balanced by taking the cartridge away. So, uh, but again, Ismail is just, he, there's something missing. And then he's listening to nonsense from Lila repeatedly. Uh, he's so worried. He's, he's, he's so nervous. He doesn't know exactly what she's up to. She sounds like, as we started, but for nothing in the world he would believe so. And uh, he wants to believe something different. Uh, and also, he's being distracted by the presence of Tsahi. I mean, yes, we had a wonderful time, but now just leave. I need to have some time with my lady <laughs> uh, to propose. <laughs> and uh, that's basically it. So, considering the bulk of what Ismail learned, what did you learn as a per personally uh, after playing this role? Do you feel like it had, had any effect on your personal views at all? Uh, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it put even more foundations to my uh, views. I mean, uh, I was lucky enough to be Egyptian, and Egypt was the first state to sign a peace agreement with Israel, uh, which is something that uh, every Egyptian is proud of. Proud of. Uh, however, I would love for uh, many other nations to, to join this peace and just uh, get all together and live under the sun in the land of Abraham and let's all enjoy life because apparently the, 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 nature's been the worst enemy now. I mean, we've yeah. been killing each other, but you hear of tornadoes and hurricanes and mudslides in Guatemala and earthquakes in Pakistan. Yeah. Uh, I think we should pay more attention to these uh, natural you know, revenge, I guess. Uh, instead of killing and fighting each other, because time is passing either way, whether we have peace or we don't. So hopefully by very soon, I mean, as long as there's some people who believe that there's peace and there's a valuable message that could be delivered, and there's audience also that will come and listen, I think it will happen and, and realize something that by the end of the show, we're given a task, a task to our audience. I mean, we're giving yeah, them homework here. Yeah a suicide bomber, regardless, we don't know if they are Jewish or Christians or Muslim, but that's a suicide bomber, she, that's exactly what she believed in, but look what she left behind her. I mean, it was devastation by all means. So is that what we really want, or should we just sit on one table like a civilized people and just discuss peace and figure out what we're going to do? Do you think it's possible? Uh, it will happen. It will happen. It, 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 we must keep our faith up. Uh, if it's not in our generation, then the generation after as long as there's life and we're surviving. But it must happen because sincerely there's a fair amount of Israelis, Palestinians and some other Arabs uh, throughout the Arab nations who are getting along very well. They have businesses together, they travel together, they're friends, families. Uh, I believe it's governments. It's been always governments and always will stay government. But as long as you keep in mind that governments are represented people and people have the desire to construct peace, Therefore, I think they will compromise. Governments will compromise. Right on. Thank you very much. That's so well put. No, I thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Nice. Great show. Thank you. Thank you. No sé si te queda algún tema pendiente que no pudimos eh, tocar, porque la verdad que es la, el, el tema es amplio, exageradamente amplio, y el tiempo pues es corto. Sí. Pero no sé si ha quedado algo que tú quisieras discutir o, o hacerle saber mm. a la teleaudiencia. Uh, creo que eso es todo, so, solo una cosa más en, no en el tema de hacer la aplicación dentro de un año. Hay, hay excepciones a esta ley, pero es, muy, es más complicado en que mm -hmm. quiero hablar en este momento. Pero si tiene una, un pensamiento de hacer una aplicación, es muy importante hablar con un abogado con experiencia. Solo, solo así. Bueno, de parte de Frutesaña Televisión, queremos darte las infinitas gracias. Eh, Hemos despejado muchos temas, eh, hemos aprendido mucho y yo creo que quienes más disfrutaron de, de todo esto fueron ustedes, queridos televidentes. Espero que se pongan en contacto con nuestra amiga acá, eh, estén pendientes de las noticias y pendientes de lo que se da en el internet y para mayor eh, información al final del programa se le va a, a facilitar el número de teléfono de la oficina de nuestra amiga Victoria Nelson y también la página del website, ¿verdad? Y todo lo que tenga que ver con su fundación. Eh, nos sentimos sumamente orgullosos de que apoyes a nuestra comunidad y quizá no todo el mundo sabía de esto, como te lo decía al principio, por falta de información, algunos por quizás por temor, por miedo, pero qué bueno que a través de esta mágica manera de llevar las cosas a su hogar, pues estamos aprovechándonos para hacerles saber de este gran mensaje, porque 
de esto se trata, de ayudar a nuestra comunidad en todos los sentidos, llevarles alegría, llevarles de todo y también información que este es muy importante. Eh, no sé si tienes algo más que decirnos para que aproveche la cámara es tuya. Bueno, well, muchas gracias para tenerme com, como una pues, pues Como una <risa> ajá, invitada, en sí. Su, en su uh, programa y creo que you know, estos temas son muy importantes a, a, a nuestra comunidad y te agradecido mucho para, para invitarme aquí. No, la, el honor es para ti y el honor es mío de, de que nos hayas acompañado y que hayas dedicado parte de tu tiempo porque sé que eres una persona muy ocupada y pues nosotros nos sentimos más orgullosos de estar contigo <risa> aquí. Aprovecha y diles dónde se encuentra ubicada tu oficina aquí en Manhattan para quienes puedan venir, que sea accesible la dirección. Uh, la dirección es uh, 350 calle 31 West, uh, pero es mejor si llama antes que venir uh, el número de teléfono es 212-714-2904. Correcto. Um, y puede llamar para hacer una cita. ¿Cuál es el horario? Uh, que te uh, localizar? Desde lunes a viernes, desde las 9 y media hasta las 5 y media. Ajá. ¿Sábado y domingo no? No, normalmente no. Sí, bueno. Espero que haya sido de su agrado y por favor, fieles a nuestro programa, nos veremos la próxima vez. Espero lo hayan disfrutado y hayan aprendido muchísimo. Les quiere y se despide su anfitriona consentida, Giovanna Castillo. Chao, chao, bye, bye.